Uh, good morning um, and welcome all. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, my name is Will Loomis. Uh, I am an associate director of the Atlantic Council's um, Cyber Statecraft Initiative. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Atlantic Council is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank located in Washington, D.C. Um, and since 1961, the Council has focused on shaping strategic communities in the United States and Europe to fulfill its mission of working together to secure the future um, across national security policy and foreign affairs. Uh, my program, the uh, Cyber Statecraft Initiative, is the Atlantic Council's cybersecurity policy program working at the nexus of geopolitics and cybersecurity to craft strategies to help shape the conduct of statecraft and to better inform and secure the users of technology. Um, along these those lines, I don't want to give too much away, but excited today to have an awesome group of folks uh, joining us to discuss how we can improve cybersecurity for critical infrastructure. Um, before we get started, just wanted to uh, flag one quick note. Um, we will have an opportunity towards the end to potentially field some questions. Um, so please use the Q&A function um, on Zoom to submit any questions. And uh, we will, um, if we have time, we'll make sure to take a look at a few of those towards the end. Um, without any further ado, uh, excited to get started here and uh, going to now introduce um, Bryson Bort, um, CEO and founder of Scythe, co-founder of the ICS Village, and an awesome non-resident senior fellow with our program. So Bryson, without take it away. All right. Hello, everybody. I see we have a few people uh, who are joining in on the phone. So I apologize. The beginning part of this program is going to be a visual presentation. Um, but this is recorded, and I'm sure we can also link my slides afterward for those of you who are just following along. Um, I will do my best, though, to describe what is happening so that you can join in with us. Okay, so we're going to um, kick off with a, a brief introduction to supply chain security, um, and then we are going to uh, have a phenomenal uh, panel with a great group. So supply chain security. Well, first of all, the reason we are having this conversation is we have a problem. Um, I always like to start with framing the context up front. Um, one, of course, it orients you to understanding why we are doing this. The second is that I find a lot of the problems that we have in cybersecurity is that others don't understand. And so when we go and try to provide those takeaways so that the organization, the mission, the business can understand and prioritize us and the cybersecurity, or in this case, the supply chain security concerns within what they're dealing with, having this context makes it easier to educate and bring them into that conversation. Um, we can't just beat them over the head with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So uh, I think the one that really put supply chain risk um, almost as a kitchen word, uh, I use that term whenever we break out of our expert echo chamber in industry, we tend to take for granted that everybody understands things like ransomware. Well, Colonial Pipeline brought ransomware to the forefront and SolarWinds a couple of years ago brought supply chain security almost to a kitchen word. It's not quite something that's bandied around the, the, the kitchen table in the average home yet, but it did break into a broader consciousness outside of our traditional ecosystem of talking about these things. Um, some of those threats include uh, like what happened with me with a beard during COVID. Uh, so there I am on uh, CBS talking about uh, solar winds. Um, but I think the one that best encapsulates what we saw with the supply chain risk was Log4j. And Log4j um, had risks, was actively being exploited, and we then found additional vulnerabilities while we were going through this. Um, and the challenge, of course, with something like Log4j is where is it in our environment? Uh, we take for granted that we know all of the components of software. Well, for those of you who haven't been paying attention, uh, software uh, and technology writ large has exponentially grown over the last few years. And what that means in individual systems is that there's an exponential increase in the amount of code. And it's so much, it is no longer the kind of thing where one person like 30 years ago would have been able to have their hands around all of the code, but it's now multiple teams of teams putting pieces together to lead, release an overall platform. And so the challenge that we have is, what are the dependencies for something like that? Where exactly is it in the environment? And we still have challenges where even to today, I don't think anybody anywhere still knows all of the locations of Log4j. <clears throat> so the summary of what we wanna take away for our problem here is that these represent vulnerabilities. And vulnerabilities by themselves 
uh, don't mean much unless there is an act of hostile intent and the capability to take advantage of it. And those vulnerabilities represent the ability for zero day, so unknown vulnerabilities that an adversary might actively research to use to build that capability. End day, which is the challenge that we have like Patch Tuesday coming out from Microsoft where we were releasing known issues. And the problem with that is by releasing the details of those known issues, we've created what's called Exploit Wednesday, which is there's an entire ecosystem looking to take advantage of those flaws. Uh, misconfigurations, it turns out even if we build everything correctly, it doesn't mean the user installs or uses it correctly, which creates potential vulnerability. And then insider threat. Uh, we have employees who for different reasons might open up vulnerability. And then we've also had the kinds of issues which we've seen before um, where developers intentionally introduce vulnerabilities into this. And then when we get to third party transparency, which is the full supply chain and what's its involvement, we have a challenge of obscurity is are things fully documented and then understanding the extent of all of those dependencies and how it impacts us. We've no longer just transferred risk. We're accepting risk by these other vendors coming into our environment. So why is your supply chain targeted? Well, first of all, bad hackers are lazy. So the adversary, the threat is always going to find the easiest way in. And chances are, if you're paying attention to this, you're not the easiest way in directly. I want to go find a place with much more opportunity and you have a trusted relationship with them. So I effectively can walk in trusted through the back door. And that leads to the second part, right? You have a trusted relationship with those places. So it's easy for me to continue to take advantage of that trust masquerading in that different guise. And then the final piece is it's very easy for me to blend. Uh, the threat, once it's in your environment, doesn't want to stick out. They don't want to be caught. They want to blend in naturally. And so the ability to walk in with the sheep's skin over the wolf automatically confers a level of advantage to blend in right in with your environment. So the most controlled industry, I would say it's probably nuclear, for example. And so when we look at supply chain, who better than this very regulated, taken very seriously industry could we think about? Um, you could probably argue the same for certain parts of defense and intelligence, but commercially available, I would say nuclear is probably the most highly regulated industry that's there. Who better to take supply chain security seriously? And yet we have problems where these power plants can still bring in counterfeit parts. Like this is this is now publicly documented. So it's it's just showing that even in a place where this is taken as seriously as it could possibly taken, there's still an issue with supply chain security. Um, just released literally this week was securing the software supply chain, um, a recommended guide for developers. And you can see this is a combination effort between um, CISA, DOD and the National Security Agency. Um, link here at the bottom for those of you who want to, to read it. Um, Conveniently, almost all of the guidance that's in uh, this document um, I've captured in this presentation in summary. So you'll be getting about a five to seven minute overview here um, through a different risk model framework called BSIM. Um, and we'll be, we'll be going through that, but that one uh, really gives more of an organizational perspective and the way I've broken it out uh, to look at. Um, but a lot of the same elements are absolutely encapsulated in here. <clears throat> So if you haven't heard of the cyber defense matrix, um, I present it here because I think this is just one of the, the great innovations in terms of being able to think about the problem. So it comes from a friend of mine named Sunil Yu, who I think is quite possibly the smartest guy in cyber I've ever met. And what he did is he broke the environment into on the Y axis, what are the classes of assets that are in my uh, enterprise? And then at the top, the NIST CSF phases of defense, identification, what do I have? protection, what's my ability to prevent unauthorized access, that's where vulnerability management happens, breach happens, and now I'm into operational awareness. What is happening in my environment? How quickly can I detect that something's gone wrong? How quickly can I respond to that? And then my ability to recover and minimize the impact of that breach. Why this is great is it's a simple tabletop exercise you can do on yourself when looking at your organization and your suppliers. Map out all of the tools, the services, the people, against these different categories. And just from that exercise, you can immediately identify what gaps you might have in your enterprise or areas of concern or areas of improvement. So let's go into supply chain risk models. So 
one of the things I, is these things need to be implementable. Having an expert sit here and preach the cybersecurity gospel of supply chain risk only goes so far. How do you implement this in your environment? And I do a lot of calls where I help organizations implement a lot of these things. And the starting point is always like, of course, where do I begin? And it's procurement. This is the chokehold that naturally already exists in the organization to provide visibility on any financial transaction. And the point here is meeting and getting procurement to be involved in this process makes it so much easier because the terms and conditions that are agreed to contractually are going to be what sets the relationship with the vendors going forward. It's really hard after a contract has been signed and the check has been cleared to go backward and get the supply chain to want to do something different. However, if you put it up front, then it's a part of it. So um, going into the building security and maturity model, the BSIM. Um, so this is, um, you know, putting the, the Atlantic Council conflict of interest hat on. All right. So I have no financial anything with them. They are a financial subscription. However, the framework itself is freely available. Um, what the subscription provides is um, they're constantly surveying all of these different industries. So they have 130 organizations across nine different verticals that are currently participating. And what they do is they share the data of all of the different cybersecurity practices that they're doing, and then what's the results of them. So that level of detail of exactly with the you know particular implementation of what's working, that's the proprietary financial side. But the rest of this, in terms of it being a great framework to look at how to implement it in your organization, freely available and is what we're going to go through here. So um, it relies on 122 activities across four domains, governance, intelligence, um, software uh, lifecycle touch points, and then, of course, deploying from software uh, into the operational environment. So starting with uh, governance, uh, governance has three sections. So of course, strategic, uh, sorry, strategy and metrics. What metrics have we used to measure the security? Um, does this require, you know, does a particular process require their use? Um, compliance and policy. Have we regulated data obligations in a formal document? Um, when you start looking at things like uh, NIST compliance, there's the different levels of how much, how mature is a process and the, the second one is, have we even documented it? Um, a lot of places are still in the first, but we have a general understanding. But until we put it in and train it, um, it's, it doesn't exist. Um, and then do we, comp do we actually impose this policy down on the vendors? So going back to the procurement aspect, it's not just, hey, we're great, but are we transferring that same level of standard down to the vendor? Because otherwise, we can be Fort Knox with a screen door back door from one of the vendors. <clears throat> and then like I was talking about, right? Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> um, policy on a piece of paper doesn't mean anything. Policy trained and enforced is the key point. And so making sure that we're doing that, again, not just for ourselves, but ourselves with respect to our vendors. Uh, intelligence. So this is where we start thinking of threat modeling, right? Attack models is what they call it in BSIM. Um, is there a data classification scheme on how it is being put together and designed and controlled by the vendor? In a SaaS environment, how are they controlling our data? In a multi-tenant SaaS environment, um, how is our data being kept different from others? Is there an attack path there that we need to think about? Uh, one of the best places I recommend for folks to start when they think about threat modeling is what's already happened to this organization? Chances are most companies and organizations at this point have already been breached understanding the history of a past attack really helps from preventing the same thing from happening again. And if nothing else, uh, it's a real strong set of progress when we allow the past to stay in the past and it's only going to be future more difficult things that trip us up. Um, are secure by design components used, right? I don't think anyone's surprised here that we need to build security into the design. Uh, in the DOD NSA uh, CISA document, um, they, they talk about how quality assurance is uh, a key part of this element where we need security training in that. Um, I think that's difficult when we call that quality assurance. I mean, at the end of the day, security testing is effectively quality assurance for a function of security, but the skill set is very different than what you see in traditional QA. 
And then uh, standards and requirements, obviously pushing down the documentation. <clears throat> now we get into the lifecycle itself, um, doing an architectural analysis. So not just looking at a system, but the system of systems perspective, uh, code review, obviously, security testing as described, um, and then deployment. So uh, making sure that we're doing a, a final focus penetration test. Um, one of the recommendations that I make here is again, not just looking at a pen test and a system view. Um, all too often we look at code in isolation and there's two disadvantages to that. One, we might be introducing vulnerability in its relationship to other components and operation, hence the need to look at it from an architectural view. Um, the second is we're not benefiting from looking at those vulnerabilities that we might be introducing into the environment that may already be mitigated or zeroed by the investment we're already making in that operational portfolio. Um, and then I don't think it's any surprise here, configuration management is 80% of information security and supply chain security. And it is the rabbit hole that is so difficult to do. Um, but vulnerability management, and this is a, again, a key part with procurement. What are the communication requirements for vulnerabilities from your vendors? What are those expectations? How do you receive those communications for it? And so uh, breaking it all together, um, I put the practices tied together with the different elements um, so that you can have a high level summary of this understanding um, and a easy to take home uh, chart. Um, in testing, um, vendor findings plus software criticality equals the risk score. Um, and the, these components are also covered in the developer model that DOD, NSA, and CISA published. Right. I'm doing uh, static analysis. I'm doing dynamic dynamic analysis. I'm doing penetration testing and fuzzing. Um, fuzzing, for those of you who aren't aware, is mangling different inputs into an application or a system to try to get an unexpected result. Um, in the the manual, uh, they note that as something that quality assurance would do. Uh, correct fuzzing is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, traditionally, this is seen in vulnerability research where you have very high end engineers. Um, looking explicitly for uh, vulnerabilities typically to, uh, to weaponize. Um, and then architecture risk analysis um, and categorizing and ranking all of those for your vendors. So the idea here is that we can't treat all vendors equally. We need to be using different elements to look at what is the risk of their platform in ourselves? What is the performance risk from using these different factors? Um, Software composition analysis, so SCA, also called out in the manual. Um, this is the process of identifying all software components. Um, the challenge is that SCA typically has been used more for licensing than a deep dive of understanding all the different elements, um, but it is a good foundation for basic vulnerability management. And then finally, uh, SBOM, so the Software Bill of Materials. Um, there are different primary levels of SBOM, but the key here is that this is the way I like to summarize it is I'm exposing my software configuration management to my customer and my user. Um, now, the challenge, of course, is what level of depth do I go down that supply chain? Because even as a vendor, I have my own challenges with my own supply chain. And so this is where we get into this, this how far do we go to implement SBOM? But um, certainly the idea with exposing that visibility is going to increase the ability for uh, folks to be able to understand supply chain risk when it becomes apparent. So in closing thoughts, right, this is a hard problem. Um, it's hard because where we are uh, requires us to start somewhere. Um, I think SBOM is a great point to be able to start to expose that, but it's going to take multiple iterations over time to be able to grow the level where this starts to become the new standard of just, again, the configuration management with understanding. Um, everything is going to the cloud. Um, anytime I ever have given a lecture and I ask how many folks are in the cloud, um, only once has anyone ever raised their hand and said, we're not in the cloud, and that's because they were migrating to the cloud. Everything is going to be going to the cloud, which again, it's you're, you're losing change management, you're losing visibility, and the fallacy that you believe you're transferring risk when you might be adopting more. Um, supply chain is a high return on investment target from a threat perspective as described. And the challenge here, of course, is the most return on investment is usually the least exciting thing to implement. <clears throat>
All right. So with that, we're going to transition into probably what's the more fun part of this, which is the panel. Um, so uh, starting off with introductions from our panelists, uh, Jabs, would you like to go first? Yeah. Jabs here, uh, full name, Danielle Jablanski. In my day job, I'm an OT cybersecurity strategist with a vendor called Nozomi Networks. Um, in that capacity, I also serve as one of the representatives on the OT Cybersecurity Coalition and the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative from uh, CISA for ICS folks. Um, I'm also a non-resident fellow with the Atlantic Council, so thanks very much for putting this together for your time and also the expertise of my fellow panelists. I'm also affiliated with Building Cybersecurity and ISA, and I will leave it at that. Ginger. Good morning. I'm Ginger Wright with the Idaho National Laboratory. I am a energy cyber portfolio manager, which means I get to instigate and manage projects that range from um, cybersecurity reverse engineering for operational technology used in energy, all the way to something called cyber informed engineering, which looks at how can we leverage our engineers and get them to start thinking about cybersecurity at the place where they begin to design the products that we all depend on. Um, and we can talk about e e any of these today. INL is very much focused on industrial control system cybersecurity, particularly for the energy sector. Um, and that is a very different supply chain than the normal IT supply chain. And again, we'll probably talk about those things as well. So I'll leave it with that, Bryson. And then uh, Munish. Yeah, hey, my name is Munish Walter Puri. Uh, until recently, I was the director of cyber risk for New York City Cyber Command. And I ended my time there as liaison officer working on public-private partnerships focused around critical infrastructure, specifically joint cyber defense and collective incident response uh, and where there's overlap between the different sectors. So very much looking forward to this conversation. I recently joined an organization called Exeger, uh, where I will be focusing on critical infrastructure, supply chain risk, and cyber risk. So very excited to be having this conversation. Um, and. Uh, be with you all. Thank you. All right, Ginger, going to be coming right out after you to start kick things off. So what kinds of challenges have you seen with supply chain security over the years? So a couple of things are rampant in at least the energy sector, where again, I spend most of my time. Uh, first, a lot of our supply chain attention right now goes into our critical information technology assets. These are assets that move bits from place to place um, that make sure that we have websites and commerce, and they're very important. But these are different, and there are different architectures and different supply chains than the systems that ensure that we have electrons going from place to place supplying energy, that water molecules move from place to place um, in our water systems. Um, and cybersecurity for these systems is different. The supply chains are different. Traditionally, vendors in these systems have been have come from small engineering firms uh, through mergers and acquisitions. By the way, one of the supply chain challenges for this area, um, they've grown larger. But historically, because they grew out of small shops founded by a great deal of expertise, the approach to cybersecurity was, hey, I make great products. You can trust me. I'm your vendor. I understand your market. We do it right. And that's the end of the story. There has not been a great deal of transparency, and it hasn't been baked into the exchange between vendor and asset owner. Um, today, as those shops now depend on more open source and more commercially co created components than the ones they create themselves internally, that you know made good here label doesn't quite stick on the way that it used to. Um, and so some of the things that we're seeing that help uh, the conversation around software bills of materials has done an amazing job at moving the ball forward in a transparency conversation between vendors and asset owners. Um, we are fortunate that through the national SCADA testbed in the past and now through a program called Citrix Cyber Testing for Resilient Industrial Control Systems, vendors are opening up their systems to allow cybersecurity researchers, vulnerability researchers specializing in operational technology to look for vulnerabilities and advise them on the best way to mitigate them um, and to work with asset owners for on-site mitigations for those vulnerabilities. So those are two things that are happening that are really helping to raise the bar and we're looking for more. Thank you. Uh, Munish, um, I, as much as you're comfortable talking about from your view and capacity in New York City, as well as 
uh, what you see going forward. Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm glad to not have to give the disclaimer that I'm speaking only on, on this is just me. I'm I'm talking now. Uh, so I'll say a couple things. I think Bryson, actually, what you laid out in the beginning, the context is really important. Some of the challenges that I've seen uh, first is definitional. We did a project where we looked at the use of the word supplier versus vendor versus third party. Seems like a pretty basic thing, but what we found is that depending on the context it meant different things. For some people, it meant business to business. Others, it meant business to consumer. Uh, even in supply chain, when we talk about supply chain, we in technology, we immediately think about uh, software code. Uh, you put supply chain and you talk about supply chain with anyone in the retail business or, or, or manufacturing, they're, they're talking hard goods. Now, conceptually, those are the same. But how you go about securing them from a cyber perspective or otherwise is very different. So I think first is definitionally has been a real challenge. Uh, the second uh, dynamic that I wanted to underscore that you pointed out, but I'd like to underline really is around procurement. And I'll say a shift in the thinking around securing third parties. And it's really about being involved in the third party process. So any organization has, as you rightly pointed out, the procurement side, there's also the legal side, you know, whether it's SLAs and, and now even more so, especially in technology, but even otherwise, um, data governance and privacy questions come up. And so there are lots of opportunities where other functions in an enterprise are carrying the water around investigating who is this third party. And then, and I know we're going to get into this, but there's, for me, at least been a shift. And when Ginger was, was talking about moving bits and bytes versus electrons, one shift that's happened, again, just in, in my frame of mind, is thinking about some of the services that critical infrastructure provides. And um, this is going to sound a little bit, um, you know, split here, but one is not tailoring you know to the technology and to the environment that's there and the second is we're, we're sort of focusing on i don't want to say the wrong things but when i think about data and the cloud and technology i think about it as a utility the same the way i think about water and power um in new york we have if i may say so pretty amazing coffee and bagels and pizza and that's because of the water um some would argue i would argue that as well so the the delivery of that, it doesn't matter what it's used for. It's a delivery of the utility. And starting to think about, for me, it was instructive to start to think about data as a utility uh, because then I started to interrogate their, their dependencies and potential fourth parties. I know we're going to get into a conversation probably around that, but those are the three dynamics that were important shifts for me. Um, as a as a chef, I, I agree. One, um, I'm well aware of how New York City um, has invested significantly in its water supply, and there could be a great argument that that is a big factor. Um, they've studied uh, French bread, and that was one of the the components along with uh, the different properties of uh, the flour. Um, also, to the definitions, I, I personally have that same challenge. It took me a number of years because I did a stint in manufacturing to hear supply chain security, and even today, literally teaching. You know, my part in this, it's still first thing that goes to is the manufacturing process. And I don't immediately think of the software uh, supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, Jabs? Yeah, I like this. Bagels as critical infrastructure belongs on a t-shirt. So that's my contribution today. Well, it's Will's contribution, but the t-shirt idea. Um, again, speaking to sort of the definition piece, but I want to back up and caveat that when we talk about supply chain risk and critical infrastructure, there's this third party dependence that we also consider supply chain risk. And that looks like disruption of not getting or not receiving a service or component that you require to have your organization or your industry continue, right? So to sustain operations, a good example of that one is the Toyota um, kind of halt and disruption in, in production. It's a manufacturing example, but it's also just, you know, just in time demand and supply of things becomes a third party risk. It's also something to consider for, for cloud uh, resilience going forward. Whereas you know, embedded supply chain risks look more like, a, you know, a vector or a vulnerability that we've been talking about so far, which, 
again, to keep that in the ICS frame, um, the target HVAC becomes the example. So I wanted to, to break that out and then go back to something you said, Bryson, which was the starting point for you is procurement. But then you said, it's actually even better if you go back and understand what your organization has already seen. Um, and I think that's the most important part, right? What do you have? Do you know what you have? Are you doing that well? I think there's a lot to digest in the open source cybersecurity community for a starting point. I think the bigger issue for supply chain risk management is where, where to end, what's enough look like, right? We don't want the government to be overly prescriptive about governance, regulations, and standards, but we do want to understand how to get these things done. How we're able to get those done depends on the sector that you're in and the resources that you have and what you know, risk mitigation you already have in place, which then depends on do you understand what you have and have you mapped that out? Have you, you know, looked at contingencies and, and things that you can use if something else is compromised or not available? Um, and then my last point that that brings me to is we constantly talk about in cybersecurity the fact that the threat landscape is so dynamic and it's always going to change. So when you put up that matrix that you think um, your professional friend for as being brilliant for having, the first thing I thought about is things on paper like that are very good for due diligence, but they also are very static. And so we constantly talk about the threat landscape evolving. What we don't talk about is that our need for situational awareness, which I think would marry your operational versus structural considerations in that, in that matrix, that also needs to change. That also needs to adapt. And so when we talk about critical infrastructure, we're still looking at drip environments, data rich, information poor. And before we get into the S-bomb and D-bomb conversations, there is so much more data. I work at an anomaly detection you know, company. There's so much more data to maximize, to benefit the supply chain conversation. So those would be my, my contributions. Uh, I hope everyone has appreciated Ginger's ghost cat um, that is half appearing with her background. If that's not a metaphor for supply chain risk security, I don't know what else would be. That'll be the next uh, cyber gang title. <laughs> yeah, ghost cat. Mm -hmm. Which country would that be? Um, not not going down that one. We'll we'll, we'll leave it just at talking uh, generically about the the threat models. Um, so Jabs, you brought up government intervention, and I think we've seen in the last year and a half a substantial change in federal government uh, interest and policy. I mean, for the first times um, coming directly out of the executive office, our commentary with explicitly saying cyber and talking about these issues, which had never happened before, right? We've all toiled in the the, the hidden regions of, of well below that, that level. And so I'm um, throwing it out to the group. Uh, what do you think is going to happen in government? And then of course, let's contrast that with what we would like to happen from government because there is them doing as much as we'd like and then them, them doing more sometimes in an effort to help and helps in quotation marks. Who wants to tackle it? I'll start, um, but I, I'm looking for others as well. Um, so what I'm seeing right now, and as a national laboratory, um, we get to execute work that is at the cornerstone of government um, in partnership with industry. So the Citrix program I mentioned, we have three vendors that participate in deep testing of their products, uh, Schweitzer, um, Schneider, and Hitachi Electric across six laboratories. So those are a lot of researchers that get to look at those products and help. And again, the government facilitates adding partners to that testing mix and ensuring that the vendors get good quality vulnerability reports from the testing that's done. Um, so that's where government is helpful and facilitative. Um, we're seeing a great deal more interest in information sharing groups. Um, I know that the Department of Energy CSER organization is starting ETAC, the Energy Threat Analysis Center, um, and that will be an information center that involves both, uh, or it involves asset owners, it may involve vendors, it will involve third-party security com companies, and of course, national laboratories. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping that the government does is offer more assistance with legacy um, and out-of-warranty products. Um, supply chain is really, really exciting for vendors while they have a product that is fresh off the assembly line and while they can commercially afford to provide a security agreement uh, with the asset owner that can be a paid security agreement. Uh, there comes a time where that's no longer viable for industry, but it may be still viable for the asset owner to continue use of that product. And today, we don't have a great place to transfer care for the security risk of legacy products except an asset owner. 
Um, and I think there could be government intervention here that would be welcome and helpful that would protect the interests of the vendors that made the product originally, but also the needs for asset owners that continue to depend on it. Um, and so the one thing I am concerned about and hope to, to talk to government about, they're getting very excited about some things in cybersecurity that are nuanced. And you talk about how we in cybersecurity think our audience understands everything about and the depth of everything that we're talking about. Concepts like zero trust, concepts like labeling products to say what is secure and what is not secure. There is a lot of nuance there. And often Washington DC does not have the time to let the geeks work through all of the nuance together and come out with a best answer. So in the things that I'm hoping that, that we don't see, I'm hoping the federal government does not get ahead of the nuanced conversation and allows the deep cybersecurity experts to help advise some of these new ideas that are coming forward. I'll jump in. Uh, I think that, uh, so this is interesting for me, recent former government official. And also I wanna, I wanna wrinkle this a little bit. Um, you know, when we talk about government, uh, let's, let's remember there's sort of a pyramid that at the top you have federal kind of narrow, then states gets larger, then local is huge, massive. It's a weird pyramid. It like stretches out like that. So when we talk about government, it, it means a lot of different things. And particularly with critical infrastructure, that is in many cases local. There is a great, there's a great, something that bothered me, this 85% number that was thrown out a lot, 85% is in private hands. So it was like 85% of what? Like where, where, where do you see that? Like, let's look sector by sector because I, I don't think that's the case. So I tried to investigate this. There was a really good lawfare uh, article was written and then on the by Paul Rosenweig a year ago. And then earlier this year, there was a great paper published investigating that. I will drop that in the chat after I'm done with my comments for folks um, investigating this fact or fiction. The reason I'm saying that though, is because um, there were two realities to me. One, there was no way to do defense of critical, critical infrastructure except collectively. That That was just a given. And the second is what is the shared responsibility model? That's that's a question we haven't really tackled, and I don't think we can have a un, we can have a unified answer, but it's going to be also varied by by the industry. Um, where I think I will say when I was talking to my counterparts in other parts of government and in the private sector, I tried to ask first, and I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back. I'm saying this like this was a very thoughtful thing. I tried to ask first, what do you need? from us that you aren't already getting from another place and be very specific about that. I think there was a sense that, well, let's get everybody together and we'll have another channel or forum for sharing information. I was like, hold on, no, do, do you need that? What do you actually need? And can I provide it? Maybe I can't provide it. I could potentially broker it, but I might not be the right, right place. So in a sense, being strategic and choosing what not to do. Um, where I did find that we had incredible leverage and, and important is we've talked about it definitionally. Um, I know there's a lot of angst and agita over choosing and defining the prioritized list, but even just agreeing that we have a prioritized list or setting services or something like that. Now I know that this is doing that and in, in doing a great job in pursuit of that, but really anchoring there and getting everyone on the same page uh, around that and the same part of the same page, not just, oh, yes, we all need to have a prioritized list, but what is actually that list and what trade-offs are we making? That's a hard conversation to have because that means you're not choosing other things. And when I had conversations with particular sectors, they would readily acknowledge, yes, no, let's, let's focus on that one first. Um, the other two pieces are around regulation. I think regulation, personal opinion, regulation needs to have and this can be in critical infrastructure. Otherwise, a really clear theory of change, that that is the intervention that you should choose that is the most optimal of the ones that are available to you. And it, it seems sometimes when it comes to critical infrastructure, that's a lever that we go to pretty quickly. It go, goes to, you know, comes up pretty often. And I would posit there are other more effective levers. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, uh, some of the work that NCD is doing around 
defining the, the, the strategy of what the federal government is doing is really important. Again, I would not go, I would try really hard to hold myself accountable and hold us accountable when we'd go to a private sector organization and say, this is what we're doing in-house. We know it's not all in order, but we're trying. This is how we're trying. Um, that's not just a good faith thing. I think there's also a sense of the, the commiseration of the complexity of trying to secure this, but at least um, you know there is an effort to say, this is what we're doing federal and this is national. And, and I applaud that. So um, there are some areas where I think it's, uh, it's a little bit complicated, but we're headed in the right direction, question mark. I, I think I think we're all questioning, like I like to say, there are no experts in the space. Um, not that I've ever worked anywhere else before, but I was a part of that 85% conversation with Dr. Paul Rosenzweig uh, over at the R Street Institute um, at the prior year. Um, on your pyramid, I think one of the challenges is, as you noted, so we have this pyramid with federal and then the real work is at the local level. I mean, that is where the water utility lies. That is not a federal thing. It's not yeah. even a state thing, yeah, but yeah. the resources, right, that the the talent, the money, it's a flipped in, it's a flipped pyramid. And that's one of the, the challenges we have with getting to that. Jabs, uh, you had something? Sure, so um, I think to answer your question pretty directly, what the government has done really well over the last couple of years is paid attention to what we all focus on and care about, which is a hooray moment, right? They understand the dependence of, of digital technologies across critical infrastructure, great. Another great thing that has been demonstrated as having a core understanding in government is that, um, some aspects of the supply chain risk management conversation are actually beyond the control of some of these asset owners and or end users, right? That understanding has actually come a long way, I would argue. Um, two things I'll point out in recent federal type governance related documents are the liquefied natural gas um, cybersecurity framework that recently came out. The three recommendations in that, back to my point earlier about you know what is enough, nobody knows. Those three recommendations actually go a very long way as a, as a baseline or a, a kind of a writ large application for all the di divergent sectors in this space. The number one, Bryson, for you, um, number one in, in vetting actually does manage or does mention configuration control, right? So that's another hooray moment. The other one I'll point to is the recent um, NIST and CISA defending against software supply chain attacks. They have this little box on the right hand side that's like not even part of the text that says simple resilience. And in that, there are these two caveats for understanding um, pre-identified alternative suppliers and uh, using the understanding of your own organization to kind of identify critical points of failure. We need to bubble that up, right? That's kind of the topic of this entire discussion. And how we do that really depends on that understanding. And I like this little box in this one document the most because I always focus on what I call ends-based versus means-based analysis for any organization. What is the worst thing that can happen to you, regardless of the capabilities out there and the dynamic threat landscape and how you work back from that? We call this crown jewel analysis, right? We've done this in ICS. So applying that kind of uh, lens, I think is really interesting. And then the last thing I'll say is that there's no good um, critical infrastructure census data about assets, services, supplies, et cetera, that exists. And Munish and I have talked about this a couple of times that the onset of a crisis looks so different for every organization, for every region, for every uh, sector. And so going back to avoiding the worst case scenario from the inside out versus top down, I think is where we need to go. And so then again, Bryson, to answer your question pretty directly, the government needs to do more about understanding that central dependence, gathering that census data in any way, shape or form, and then understanding what costs and subsidies and augmentation can be provided to reduce the dependency and, and the risk. Um, I actually have an idea for how to get to that, a couple different ideas, but to your nuclear point, we've done this really well for nuclear weapons supply chain, but the cost would be exorbitant to the commercial application. So what is the efficient and effective cost we can you know, reasonably put on asset owners and what can we subsidize and augment from a government standpoint? But we can't do that without the census data. So talking about cost, that just jogged an anecdote. Um, this was 14 years ago. Um, so I'm, I'm a threat guy. I come from the offensive side. So I always think about everything in terms of the threat, as you were talking about earlier, Jabs. And we were briefing uh, a DOD CIO on the threat to his supply chain and how we would be able to, you know, what the compromised vulnerabilities were. And he was, his response was a simple one of cost. I can't spend 25% more for a computer. 
And so we have this challenge across different industries that have different requirements. You mentioned nuclear weapons. I talked about commercial nuclear as an example where the clear risk and impact is so great that we are willing to bear the cost for that. But is that the same everywhere? Um, the other to what you, you were talking about with resilience, um, I always like to tie it back into, again, from our little nerd realm, how do we fit this into normal operations? And the normal process for any organization is business continuity planning. We already have built in disaster recovery. If you're a public company, you're required to disclose and to manage that. If you're a government organization, that is mandatory as a part of what you do. And so here's an example where we can tie in a security concern naturally into a place that already has mission attention and budget. Now, we, uh, Munish, you talked earlier about data, and I'm going to throw it back into the conversation with a little twist. So one, I like to mix it up because it's, it's more fun. Two, it has been put upon us in the last two years as because it came from the White House that this is something we're going to do. And like anything where it is a set of words up here and what happens down here, there can be a long distance in game of telephone. So with that, the bomb is zero trust. Everybody is talking about zero trust. Everybody is trying to implement zero trust. Every product of any type now does zero trust. How does zero trust effectively work tying into the data question, but back into how we architect and look at our supply chain security? And I'm going to let whoever wants to go first on that one, because that's a loaded statement. Or I can just pick you if you all... if. <laughs> Munish, oh, you're going to get to go first. No, Ginger, hey, you want, no, you no, that's it. fine. Uh, I, I mean, I was talking with someone who has a technological but not a cyber background about zero trust, um, which was really interesting because um, I could almost take for granted that they had some understanding. But I was th their question was, is there there there? underneath zero trust like what what is that so let's let's start a little bit definitionally and i tend to think in analogies i was so here in new york we have a number of museums and with those museums you can enter in and they're you know they might see if you have the admission uh but they're not identifying you as a as a person um do you have admission there and then you go in and you can interact with, so to speak, get very close to the crown jewels. Literally, you can go and see, you can be next to the most precious things in that building. Now, you talk to people who work in physical security there, and it's like, it's a completely different mindset. It's a completely different mindset. There isn't a sense of like, who are you? And is, you know, what we've had, prior to this in security is who, who are you and do you, are you on this list and do you have a ticket? Um, I'm trying to stay uh, a little bit out of the technical right now, but just a sense of, do you belong here in this moment? Right? Do, you, do you belong here in this moment? Can you come access these crown jewels? And there still is observation and there still are uh, different models of providing defense as we think about it, uh, but it's a pretty open plan. It's a pretty open plan. Um, and it's a shift. It's a shift in the in the mindset. Uh, this also goes to a really important notion that we have uh, in cybersecurity. At least I believe that securing technology requires trust between humans. And we're saying, you know, trust the humans, but zero trust of them in their identity and their technological presence. So there's there's something to be squared here. Um, I'm definitely not answering your question <laughs> uh, around data and third parties adoption of zero trust. I think where I'm where I'm going though is to start with this definitional and do we have an understanding of what the parameters are and maybe not what perfect looks like, but to, to DJ's earlier point, what does good enough look like in a zero trust environment and deployment? Ginger, you wanted to hop on earlier? Sure. I'm, I'm excited about zero trust. I think first, it's a great marketing term, and I don't mean to diminish it, but by that I'm saying it's a limit curve. Um, we can start on the journey to zero trust very easily, but quickly it tips up and becomes more difficult. So I think like anything complex, we've got to figure out what part of that problem we want to solve. 
Um, we've talked about consequences on this conversation so far, and it's so important to leverage, you know, I don't need to have zero trust or I don't need to implement zero trust for everything all at once. I need to figure out what are my worst consequences? How does my supply chain impact those worst consequences? And then how can I identify pockets of unverified trust um, because I, I and, and then start to work on how to mitigate those consequences before they happen. Um, we talk about unverified trust. Um, I can have trust, but then I have instruments like uh, sensors and other things that let me verify that my trust was well-placed. Um, so again, a zero trust upfront, it may be, you may implement this in tiers where you have some trust, but then you verify it with sensors. Um, last, with a supply chain right now, getting to zero trust in supply chain is a very complex thing. It requires first that I understand everything and the making of everything and the assumptions around the making of everything that I'm putting into my products, but also that I've gone the other way back up the supply chain so that the most um, distant from me component maker understands how I'm using their component and the criticality of that component to my enterprise. And they then work with me to take on some of the trust that is required because they're not just making waffle irons or they're not just making an open source component that says boo, they're actually contributing to critical infrastructure. Um, so I, I'm challenged with the idea that we would quickly implement this complex concept called zero trust. I think there's a lot more conversation that we should do and a lot more research um, because it's going to be complex and it's gonna take a long time. So I'll leave that. Hopefully someone will argue with me and has a quick immediate fix. I would say that, you know, when you cut off the head of a snake, another one goes back. We cut off perimeter security as being the staple for cybersecurity. And the one that grew back was zero trust. And I'm a big fan actually of it. Back to the point that I read from the NIST and CISA document about resilience, talked about use your understanding of how software supports critical business or mission functions to identify failover processes and workarounds in the event that functionality is disrupted when a specific software becomes unavailable. The first call to action is, quote unquote, use your understanding. So back to Bryson, your opening of this conversation. Well, what does that mean? How do I use my understanding? I can be an expert all day. I can throw data places. I can centralize data. I can analyze data. But what can I do? I can implement a zero trust architecture based on my understanding of my organization and my processes and my failover and my mission critical segments in a way that isn't just network segmentation and the principle of least privilege with a, with a mask on. And, and I'll just add to that anecdotally that I, I just spent this exercise because we're coming to the holidays and the year end, and you'll start to see some trends and analysis work on what did we see in 2022? What do we think about for 2023? And what I realized is zero trust is just the state of the union address for what Ginger was just mentioning, which is this critical moment for trust and verification. I think historically, those might have been mutually exclusive on accident, maybe, um, question mark. Uh, but I looked back and it's not just the zero trust conversation. Um, the volunteer army in Ukraine, that's a trust fall. That is a trust and verification conversation. How far are you going? What are the red lines look like? Are we doing this correctly? That's a trust and verification conversation. Cyber insurance market, trust and verification conversation. Zero trust and zero trust architectures, trust and verification. How much can you do? The industrial cybersecurity market writ large, continuous monitoring of OT systems, trust and verification. You see it over and over and over and over. Um, and so I actually just think that it's meeting the moment. I don't think that it is something that we have to make fun of, or um, I don't think it will live on forever. I don't think it's the, you know, the greatest thing to ever happen, but I, I think it's an implementation of the broader landscape that we're seeing. Can you expound on where you talked about trust and verification in the Ukrainian scenario? So just the fact that it was unprecedented that we saw direct government ministries responsible for nation state level operations in cyberspace directing the activity of crowdsourced operations. That's a huge trust relationship that we hadn't seen distinctively in, in the open source world. Um, and I think that that was kind of a turning point where it's and, and I keep joking internally at Azomi, it's this show me the receipts, right? What are we doing? How far are we willing to go? And what does trust and verification look like? And what happens if we don't have one or the other? So explicitly, the Ukrainian IT army, which is a collection of civilians um, operating independently, conducting offensive operations on Russia. 
Correct. But there was at least one one incident in which the directions were provided by one of the ministries. And I can link to that as well, which is something we hadn't seen before again in open source. Yeah, I remember when uh, Victor Jora, who is the deputy director of their equivalent of the NSA, was visiting here in Washington, D.C. in August, and he literally put out a direct call to the crowd to participate in what is effectively a hacktivist movement. A lot of trust. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, all right, so that was that was that piece. I was kind of going on that. Um, all right, so um, we've... I think zero trust, Ginger, to your comment on if anybody argue if, if, if it already exists or is simple is the fact that one, it's not. And the reason it's not is it goes back, I think, to the same foundation we have as a challenge across the board, configuration management. We have known since the creation of ITIL in the 1980s that configuration management and then the control, right? And from an IT asset perspective, my change management to manage my control from a security aspect, what we talked about with monitoring. Um, from my army background, we always talked about an obstacle is not an obstacle if it doesn't have overwatch. Just like a control isn't a true control if I can't monitor for how that control is effectively working in operation. And the reality is no tool is going to give you any of that. Tools can make it easier to manage and administer segmentation, micro segmentation and different aspects of a zero trust infrastructure. But Jab's going to what you described, right? It begins with our understanding begins with our own knowledge of ourselves. Know thyself before you can administer any solution. So uh, how are we how are we going to solve configuration management? Well, I think one of the things that you mentioned in your presentation and that we're fighting, so I kind of want to bring us back to workforce development because we've talked about past, present, future, but workforce development is really where we're going. Um, a lot of these things are hard. They require very specific training, um, and they aren't the most exciting part of a cybersecurity career. So I think one of the challenges for those of us who are turning the dirt today is to understand how we can attract people to become interested in um, establishing zero trust in supply chain management and supply chain analysis all the way back up to the, the first component. Um, and how we can make these careers attractive and interesting for folks going forward. What kinds of knowledge do, they, do people need to practice this? Um, how do we make the reward system so that you stay with this instead of going off into something that lets um, you do more hands-on work with either equipment or an adversary? Um, so hope we've got some training. Again, the national labs are working in this area. We've got some training that starts this, um, but I think uh, Munish, you may have ideas here. The real challenge will be state and local as far as getting the workforce to do this work. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I wanna um, give a shout out to Idaho. That training has been pretty fantastic and uh, open access. Um, uh, FedVTE is a resource that is available to anyone that works for a, a state and local government. Um, I have sent that link around many, many times. I will share it here too. Um, that is free and available. And there is more advanced training. There's a 301 training that's both virtual and in person that is pretty fantastic. And I've um, done that training, uh, part of that training, and then uh, other commercial training as well. And it definitely holds up. Um, the So I'll, I'll come to that in, in a second. I think, um, Bryson, something you talked about earlier, resourcing when I think about risk management, I think it's an exercise in resource allocation. That's it. And I don't mean money necessarily. It could be attention, it could be capital, it could be people, tooling, doesn't matter, resources. You're allocating resources towards that, managing that risk to control, transfer, uh, potentially to avoid it. And if you don't allocate any resources, you're accepting that risk. And I say that with no judgment about the decision to accept that risk. The thing that I do think is important that is, is hard for some of the local and municipalities and, and governments to frame around is in when we talk in the commercial space about security and, and the business unit and empowering the business unit and the cost of not doing that, uh, we're generally using the same units across different 
groups that are endeavoring here. But when you're talking about a local government, dollars are not often the unit that they're using. It's the services they provide, the number of people that they reach, the lives that are saved, the, um, the number of gallons that are, are being delivered. There's the residents that they're serving. They're different metrics. So in a way, that's a conversation that is better suited to critical infrastructure than other parts of security. Because we don't spend much time, because there's a general consensus about the why we're doing this. I mean, you have to remind people why they're doing the why, but in critical infrastructure, you actually don't very often. That's, I find, different than other parts of conventional IT security. So that's one thing, the narrative, what, what I encourage my colleagues and others, you know, the partners that we would work with is that we already have the why. We don't have to make that case. And we also have a reasonable sense of the what. It is complex. It takes time. It will take resources, but we have a reasonable sense of the what. <laughs> the thing we get stuck on is the how. And uh, there is definitely a workforce aspect of it. Some of that is training. I really try and advocate for cross-training. This idea that instead of bringing someone up, we bring someone over. It was just as crucial for us to have somebody that understood how that agency deployed its OT as it was that that agency delivered its services. Those two went hand in hand. And that was a big part of the how, is that cross-training, at least in my mind. Uh, the second big part of the how and, and resourcing is a cultural shift. Sometimes it's language, sometimes it's linguistic, but it's cultural. To me, cybersecurity is a public safety issue. It is also a national security issue. It's definitely an economic security issue. There's no question about this, but it's also a public safety issue. And when I first joined Cyber Command, uh, that was not in any way accepted. I, I shouldn't say it was rejected. It was just like, huh, okay, interesting. And it was almost like, and I, I can't take full credit for this, we were fighting fires before there were fire departments. So what it was like. And it is well before our collective time when that was the case. And I won't go too much on this tangent, but it was privatized. So my insurance companies there were private fire brigades. You could get it if you could afford it. And that is not the case if you're a hospital or a clinic or a healthcare, you know, clinic, healthcare delivery organization or a school. Um, and in some cases, and you pointed out, and I, I want to emphasize the, the municipalities for water, um, emergency communications, public service answering centers uh, or uh, program PSAP, you know, 911, very often those for very small municipalities, they will share a call center for 911. So who is responsible and what is the resourcing there? So I don't just want to admire this problem and, and ask a hard question and go, I'm done. What, what I think is important is, and it's interesting for me to, to say, because I've, I've thought this, but I haven't actually said it out loud, here goes, is um, one of the things I think the federal government can do better is resource locals directly. Right now, resourcing happens through two grants, Urban Area Security Initiative and the newly announced state and local cybersecurity grant. Both of those come through the state first. So it follows those conventional, and I'm not saying let's mess it up and go directly there, but there is a different model of directly resourcing some of those organizations. Now in the state and local, and I, I will end after this, the state and local grant, one thing they did that I thought was very forward thinking is they, um, they have basically a time limit on how long they're gonna give the award for, but they did a carve out if you do multi-jurisdictional. And I think we need more of that. We need to align the resources and incentives the things that line up around critical infrastructure. So tag it to a sector, tag it to a national critical function, show that it's multi-jurisdictional, show that this is a resource area that serves a greater population. And again, that's something that aligns really nicely with our framing in ICS and OT. That's how we think about it, you know, sometimes in the safety framing or in the delivery, service delivery, so to speak. And rent, thank you. So we, we do have proof of an example of that, and that was uh, CISA's work um, getting to the local level with election security over the last- Yes, very good example, very good example. And the example I would argue that proves the rule. 
right? That they, they, this is what you want to be pushing for in most cases, or you want to make the case why you shouldn't be taking that approach. But yeah, great example. So it is doable. As audacious as it is, it is doable. And to um, Ginger's point, that was that was about people in my mind. That was about people. You had people all over the country in, in state and local doing what they need to do because we had the shift from securing electoral technology to securing the electoral process. Um, Jabs, anything else you had to add on that? Just a little, little bit. Um, I, I mentioned this kind of critical infrastructure census data and how do we carry out census data? That's boots on the ground. It's extremely local. And so I think that that's an initiative that would warrant some type of resourcing based on everything that was just kind of outlined for the state and local impacts. And, and what was really discussed was impact and fallout analysis, which there's just so much more to be conducted. The one thing I want to add to that conversation or the rant um, is something you mentioned, which is identifying what or how much serves a greater population. That works for some sectors like energy specifically. It doesn't work for all sectors because there's more resources in big cities than there are in rural populations. So there's actually some points where um, locality matters because of the resources, there's going to be an outsized impact. And actually that might be a priority more so than somewhere that it's it some, whatever you're talking about might serve a greater population, but they also might have more capability to respond, recover and build resilience. So that's just something I wanted to add. It's not always um, obvious and it's, it's not well understood back to our, you know, based on your own understanding. I don't think that that locality and impact analysis has been done. Thoroughly. That's a really fair point about the um, population and density and concentration. And oftentimes when people say, well, what is New York doing? Should we do that? I would say, don't index on us. Don't index on us. We're uh, all told, we're, I thought we were relatively well resourced in talking to some of our peers. I believe that we were. And there was visibility and brand and all kinds of other things. And so um, I, I definitely second your point that it's, um, you know, it's not just about the, the big cities, but also the other communities. All right, we have an audience question. And by the way, for the audience, if you do have questions, you are welcome to put them in the chat or the Q&A tool. So uh, what do you see as the most effective and most approachable tool for government to use to encourage the development of products that are secure by design? Does this tool look more like a carrot or like a stick? So I've got one there that I would love to talk about. Um, the National Lab and the Department of Energy have collaborated on a strategy for cyber-informed engineering. The operational technology systems that I live with, um, often the cybersecurity thinking is put off until the end. I'll give you an example. There was a DOE project manager that I got a chance to talk to, and he was so excited about this hydrogen reactor technology, um, and they had just finished their pilot reactor. And I looked at him and said, so what are you doing for cybersecurity? And he looked back at me like I had three heads and said, well, this is just the pilot phase. We don't have to think about that yet. And that was when I knew something was going wrong in the engineering sector. So with cyber-informed engineering, the idea is that we start at the design concept phase in thinking about everything we've been talking about today. What are the consequences if something goes wrong? Where will I eventually employ digital technology? Even if I don't know what that looks like today, I do know the kinds of process needs that I will have and the information types that digital technology will give me and the assumptions I'm making about how that digital technology works. If I can use those assumptions to start to design so that a failure doesn't become a catastrophe, it just becomes a nuisance, then I am encouraging security by design. Um, but I will say security by design, like a lot of the things we've been talking about today, is not a panacea. It's not a place where I can move the slider all the way in one direction and I get this magic thing that is secure. I'll use as an example for that the fork. We all eat with a fork every day, and most of us are pretty good at using that tool. However, it is not secure by design. If I drop it and put my hand down the wrong way, I can pierce myself with it. I can poke somebody else. I could become a real nuisance with this tool. So it's designed for the purpose. It's been refined over uh, at least a few thousand years to do this correctly, but it is not. Um, a secure by design tool to the utmost, kind of like zero trust. It's not an absolute. So part of what we have to do in um, making a secure by design 
approach is documenting. What does the vendor believe that they have done? What consequences did they consider? How did they mitigate those risks? And then how are they transferring a bag of risk to the asset owner so that the asset owner can begin with that level of thinking? Um, the final thing I'll talk about with cyber informed engineering, we're, we're working with universities to change how we train engineers so that they come out of engineering school aware of the frailties of digital technology and how it can let them down um, so that they can again design around it. By this, what we really hope to do is raise the standard of care, uh, that basic expectation that one has for a professional engineer delivering an engineered system, that they have thought about cybersecurity consequences, that they have developed mitigations, and most importantly, that they've documented how they made assumptions, what they did to mitigate, and the risk that they do not believe that they have fully absolved by their design. So those are the things we are doing. I do believe this has to be voluntary, but we can use mechanisms like the idea of a standard of care to help industry change itself um, so that what a professional does, we raise the bar on the expectation there, and then all of industry will move. Thank you. I'll jump in here um, just to switch up the, the routine. Um, I will say that there's so much work to be done on this aspect. And so much of it actually falls back to the software side just for ICS. The conversation that asset owners are having on vetting suppliers, moving to looking at the difference between proprietary versus open source software and kind of once it's left and it's operationalized, how do you go back and figure that all out when risks can obviously arise at any point in a life cycle or, or in the any link in the supply chain, right? That's been noted. Um, that really comes back to configuration control, which is something that we've talked about all the time. It's kind of like the least sexy, not easiest to do, but biggest ROI. And so I will tell a story because you used an analogy. Um, we've all heard of the Titanic and we typically think of the movie and we make fun of Rose for not leaving enough room on the door. However, the Titanic was a real event where people died. It was a real catastrophe. And it was something that arguably to some people, I'm not arguing either way, could have been prevented. And so this is my, my story that I'll share just because we have the time. I had the opportunity to visit Belfast and I was standing in the Titanic Museum where they have a gift shop and they have stuffed Titanic boats and all of these things. And I'm thinking to myself, like, this was a real tragedy, right? And so out loud, because I never keep things in my head, I said, they're oddly proud of a boat that sank in the gift shop. Like, it's weird to me, right, that there's trinkets. And literally a worker in the, in the gift shop said, it was fine when it left. That shouted out, didn't even know they were there. He just said, it was fine when it left. And I think that's the conversation we have around secure by design. There's so much work to be done. What is enough is still the open question when there's so much work to be done. How do we get it right is still a configuration control conversation, in my opinion. DJ, that's great. It was fine when it left. What? Are you I've, I've, here? Yeah, I've tweeted this story because I was just like, I'm going to put this $15 toy down and yeah. go, get, go get some. Wow. Um, I, I like this question, but TG, I want to uh, get to something that you talked about is the um, configuration management being, I don't want to say boring, but just so such important hard work. It's like, I, I think that's true in cybersecurity in general. There's there's some real cornerstones, at least of our cyber defense that were just felt like spade work, but were so crucial and earned us that trust, earned us that trust with organizations and with our counterparts that we then could capitalize on for the bigger moves. Um, and again, it's to me about accruing that that resource, that trust capital that then you spend on the, the really hard, the really tricky efforts. Um, I, I put in the chat the link to the Cyber Informed Engineering with uh, Caesar DOE and INL. Really great, really great approach. Yeah, uh, practical, pragmatic, um, and also just a good example of making something that is highly technical accessible. And, and forward thinking. So I wanted to applaud that effort too. Um, my answer to this question is uh, related to Bryson Sling. You talked about um, in your presentation, which if I could just one constructive thing, if you could add like music, like sound effects to it, like old school, I feel like those are like a drum roll. The Titanic soundtrack would be good. Yeah, because procurement, procurement's it. But if you did like drum roll procurement, um, that to me is... Uh, when I was working for the city, I 
I realized we had this huge lever of lining all these things up. And um, th at Cyber Command, we did have some ability to do a review when agencies were thinking about acquiring technology that was used for cybersecurity. My goal, what I really wanted to do is move that to the front. And there's this trilemma, I think, in supply chain between supplier security, supplier diversity, and supplier resiliency. You know, you want some redundancy um, for resiliency. You also want diversity and you want security. And so where do you place your effort? Do you want like a lot of suppliers? Do you want as many as possible? Probably not, right? And, and trying to find that balance. One of the things I thought about, the other thing from a supplier diversity perspective that, you know, can mean geographic, it can mean different supply chain routes and distribution. Um, for some commercial uh, and private sector folks, it means uh, different countries and different geopolitical environments, uh, different exposure to extreme weather events and climate change. Um, for others, it can mean focusing on minority and women business enterprises. And one idea that I had was to, to answer the question around carrot or stick, I think it's carrot cake. Carrot cake. I'm going to go with carrot cake. It's carrot cake because it was um, fast tracking this group that had demonstrated its security posture. And maybe it was they go through a review up front and they get fast, fast track procurement for, uh, which, for the city, which can be quite bureaucratic. And, uh, you know, there are elements of that that exist. It is really threading them together to create this, this pull mechanism where we're rewarding that behavior. And I think there might be, and lining up the incentives that way, I wonder if there might be a similar opportunity in terms of, um, you know, the how is a question here, but in terms of uh, rewarding organizations that create products that are secure by design in the, in the procurement side, you know, giving them a, a kind of fast track, fast track to that. I'm just going to quickly add something that because we didn't answer the first part of the question, which is which is the most effective and most approachable tool. I think that that's really difficult. And I have another kind of two part answer on that, which goes back to when Bryson asked, what does the government do? Well, I mentioned scoping, right? Understanding the scope. And so on the asset owner and user side, I mentioned configuration control, but the scope where the government says these are the aspects we believe are in your control and this is what you can do. And this is what enough looks like on the how to side is the best way to kind of promote that. Um, and then just really briefly on the tool set side, you'll see a lot of companies and people entering the chat on supply chain security. And I mentioned earlier that there's a lot more to be gleaned from the data we have. I don't mean that you should trust every tool, vendor, solution, et cetera, that's out there that says we can automate all of your supply chain concerns and sky's the limit because we have the cloud and you can trust us. So um, just as important as it is to vet your vendors and suppliers when you're purchasing hardware, software, and systems components, vet you know, your supply chain curiosity in the same way, right? Don't just think you can outsource something because they promise to use all of the available data or they promise to meet the most recent government mandate or recommendation or guidance, right? You have to vet your risk management approach to supply chain security in the same way you would vet any of those things you purchase and acquire. And I think the other piece of that is if you can't do security by design, if you don't have control over that, then you also need to require security in your RFIs. You need to ask questions about vulnerability disclosures, just like Bryson mentioned. I always tell folks if there's none or if there's no process, run, right? Um, so there's a lot of other kind of different uh, contingency questions to bake into how we would answer that question from the audience. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weigh in on this question too, and then go to uh, conclusion remarks from everybody. Um, this is one area where I think government actually should be a really hard stick. Now, what I mean by that is, so everybody knows about shadow IT in an organization, but there's also a shadow internet. And that's because while Manish talked earlier, it's easy to get folks' attention on critical infrastructure because the impacts to society are obvious. It gets a little more murky when we're talking about general software and supply chain security writ large industry independent. And the reality is there's this thing called the shadow internet, which is the fact that there's this constant web of all these connections and trusted relationships and businesses that nobody knows about. And they are absolutely an opportunity for the threat. And so the reality is 
Nobody sits alone anymore. No business can be Fort Knox by itself. We are all collectively in this together as a country and as a world. And the impacts are no longer just data. They're the potential loss of life and limb. And so from that perspective, we should treat it as a full national security and a personal safety issue. And so I don't think that the government can be draconian and saying, you know, these are the absolute standards. I think there are a lot of best practices that we can mandate that still are elusive. Simple things like not having hard coded passwords, forcing password updates, right? Having a public vulnerability disclosure um, point of contact and that you are, man you know, that you are resourcing it to, to work it. Like those are basic things that can be a part of design and architecture that advance us significantly. But as it's been mentioned in this panel already, it's the operational life cycle that is the most challenging. It turns out we can never design everything, anything to be perfect. The user is the variable that is infinitely going to change and affect what happens in operation. And so the final stick that I would put here though, is if a company, a company should plan for end of life. And the real stick there to keep the end of life as long as possible is if you end of life, your code, you're required to open source it. Now that doesn't solve the problem necessarily, but at least it gives everybody a fighting chance and is a really strong stick for you to stick and support your product as long as possible. So that's a really contentious statement, but um, just where I really have a strong belief that we need to stop pretending that this is a carrot or stick thing when we are all going down together. So final comments on the overall sub security supply chain uh, question. Um, and Jabs, I'm gonna go right back to you to start Cool. Um, we didn't mention that supply chain attacks from an adversarial perspective are costly and extremely sophisticated. And I don't say that so that you should ignore everything else we've said. I say that so you understand that doing something, anything, picking a framework, starting somewhere, moving the ball forward will actually set you apart by some st statistically significant figure from your counterparts, from the rest of the industry. So please do go look at these resources, find what you can wrap your head around, define your own understanding, look at your own systems, right? Understand your impact and fallout analysis and all of those things in this ecosystem. The last thing I'll put in a plug for because we have shared so many um, resources today is there's a SANS talk that is public. It's called Good Practices for ICS Supply Chain Risk Management. I mentioned earlier, I had this idea of how we start with that census data. Um, the presenter's name was Hiroshi Sasaki um, in an APAC summit for ICS. And there's seven categories in there that he presented for organizations to bucket how they do supply chain cybersecurity. Um, and I would actually argue that those are the right buckets for every sector as well. So we can bubble it up. So I'll put that in the chat. Um, but I, I wanted, I didn't want to read those seven buckets to you all, but I'll share that. And I think it's a good starting place to pick and choose from all of the great resources that have been reiterated um, throughout the, the conversation. So thanks again, everyone, for your time. Minish, you're next. You got one minute. All right. Um... I think the the thing that I want to underline is to be supply chain curious, <laughs> uh, to in and and not just investigate, but think about the other people in your organization or your agency or your government that are also thinking about the supply chain, because there's a really good chance that they will have levers or insight or at least the ability to illuminate that supply chain in a way that you cannot. There is a pretty good chance that they'll have an ability to influence that supply chain. And it's rare in security that we get to move our initiatives forward on someone else's dime. And I think there's a really great opportunity to do that, whether it's legal, procurement, Data privacy, there are a number of different ways to do that. And if you're in state and local, um, keep up the good work. Uh, there's a lot of great training resources for you out there. I mentioned FedVTE, uh, the ICS Joint Working Group from CISA. Dale Peterson has been doing some yeoman's work on putting the S4 stuff out there on YouTube. I learned a, a bunch of things from there. So um, I would encourage you to, to check out those resources. Thank you again for this opportunity. Ginger? Sure. So one more great t-shirt suggestion in addition to all the great resources, supply chain curious. Uh, I'd like to print those and start handing those out for sure. Um, a couple of things we've talked about, um, and I'll, I'll just underscore really getting to know your business, your function, your processes. What are the critical ones? Would your CEO, would your board say the same thing that you do? do does your CISO agree? Does the CFO agree? Once you can understand the consequences that you are most concerned about, then you can start to really make sense of a very complicated supply chain. 
Um, I would encourage, there are a lot of standards for cybersecurity, for supply chain security. One of the most important parts is pick one, but test what you, what you actually achieved. Do not validate what you intended, validate what you accomplished. Um, and then um, understand who in your organization knows what about your supply chain um, and how they can know more, what assumptions are they making and who might validate those assumptions. Because all of this focuses on having a very robust and curious security culture that understands supply chain as an element of security. And well, with that, we have completed our formal portion of the supply chain risk security panel. Hey, uh, I just want to say um, this is a great discussion here today. It's really essential that we we take the time to talk about um, how we can mitigate uh, these types of supply chain risks and better secure our critical infrastructure. And I uh, couldn't think of a better group uh, than this one right here to, to talk about those those needs. Um, huge thanks to Bryson, to Ginger, to DJ, and to Munich for taking the time to join us today. Um, and hope you all really enjoyed the conversation. Um, thanks to the audience uh, as well for taking the time out of their day um, to spend these 90 minutes with us. Um, keep an eye out on our Twitter. Um, there'll be a lot more, uh, more to come uh, this year from the Atlantic Council of Cyber Statecraft Initiative. Um, hope everybody has a good rest of their week and thanks again for joining.